Um, it's way more exhausting to censor yourself all the time. And if you're honest and authentic, maybe not everybody's going to like you, but you're going to have more energy to do what you want to do at the end of the day. Love it. Welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Just sit back, relax, and learn from the leaders of today. It's a journey. Each one is different, unique, inspiring. Let's get started. This episode is powered by Jay Ventures, a community-driven VC fund in Silicon Valley in partnership with Lomitech and sponsored by Homeward Ventures, Hippo Insurance, Upwest, Hillel at Stanford, Leap, and Birthright Excel. Hello, and welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Today, I am joined by Dr. Irene Reeves, President and Managing Director of NextGen's LLC. As a researcher, author, and leading advisor to many of America's top executives, Dr. Irene N. Reeves offers expertise and insights on a wide range of leadership and workplace culture topics. For over 20 years, corporate leaders have turned to Irene to consult on their most formidable challenges, both in the workplace and the court of public opinion. Irene is a best-selling author of three books, The Next IQ, One Size Never Fits All, and Smarter Than a Lie. Her latest book, In Charge, The Energy Management Guide for Badass Women Who Are Tired of Being Tired, was released on March 2022. Irene has designed and led comprehensive research projects on topics including gender equity, generational diversity, LGBTQI diversity, racial and ethnic diversity, cultural integration, implicit bias, transformational leadership, and working through generational differences. She is the founder and managing director of the research and advisory firm NextGens, which specializes in workplace culture change. Irene began her career as a practicing attorney. I think you, you truly embody the, the type of person that I that I hope to speak with on this show. It's I believe you use the words intellectually voracious and committed uh, to exploring and then exploring s- some some really fascinating things. But but this idea of being extremely curious and and uh, not settling for for a truth that we're given, but but continue but continuously challenging the norms and and understanding what's happening. And obviously with with your books that you're publishing, and I believe one that was just published in in March. You know, really challenging the status quo and how people think uh, through their own careers, through the workplace, and and uh, and both your work with Nor- Northwestern and with NextGen's LLC, uh, really, really interesting modes of work and and fields of research. And so I'm I'm looking to pick your brain in these 20 minutes a little bit about some of the topics that that you are most excited about and and probably some non-trivial things that I and whoever's listening wouldn't know. So Aaron, thank you very much for joining. Of course, of course. Now, research in the workplace, start there. What, what, what does that mean for you? What, what do you think through when you hear that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, you talked about me being curious. I am very curious. Um, I'm not just curious about, you know, the way things work. I'm curious about why they're structured the way they are, right? So, for example, I was a lawyer. Um, I practiced law, and I loved it. I still do love law, and I am still a licensed lawyer. Um, But I was very curious about why do we structure the legal system a particular way? Why do we say certain things are in the purview of the legal system and certain things are in the purview of social science, right? Like, Hmm. why is one thing here and another thing here? So... My foray into social science, specifically neurobehavioral sociology, after I was practicing law, is is sort of moving away from just being curious within law, but saying, wait a minute, when did we decide that it's got to be this way? Like, this belonged over here and this belonged over there. So from the social science perspective, a lot of the research I do in workplaces is why, why are workplaces structured that way, right? Why... Simple things. Why is hiring season when it is, right? Why are evaluation forms, why do they look the way they do? Um, Why are, you know, calendar years different than fiscal years? And how do those affect the way that people work? So a lot of what we do in workplaces is we go in and through quantitative and qualitative um, tools, try to understand how workplaces work. Now, a lot of people do that. We do that from the mission of, we want workplaces to work better for everyone, right? And the reality is workplaces, because of how they're designed, who they're designed by, certain workplaces work really well for some people and not others. So they may work for people who were born in the United States and not work for people who are not. They may work really well for women 
not for men, or they may work really well for men, but not for women. So we try to understand structurally how they're working, how that influences culture, and then how culture then translates into what we all do, right? Like the behavior on a day-to-day basis. And our consulting work is sort of working backwards and saying, okay, now that structure, we understand the structure, we understand the foundations of the culture and the behavior. Here's what we think you need to change. If you want to change the outcomes of behavior, if you want to change the outcomes of culture. So that's what we do. I love it. I've been doing it for over 20 years. And it is a mixture of understanding the law, but understanding social science. And I think the practicality of creating change. So you're, you're mentioning the distinction between, you know, what is the motivation for the research and, and what are you optimizing for? What, what is the difference when you're optimizing for perhaps the prosperity of a company and, and so that the CEO comes in and says, listen, I need some help to re- to, f- to look at my evaluation forms because I want to improve my, my profitability or my, my ARR next year versus looking at it from a lens of fairness and equality and how to make this a workplace that suits, that, that suits all people. How, how is that different in terms of the, the work that you do? You know, I, I think one of the things that, that we talk to leaders about, I work with a lot of um, Fortune 500 companies, we work globally, is those are not different, right? And so, for example, right now, we know that organizations are dealing with really high levels of attrition, right? They're calling it the great resignation. Um, I don't call it the great resignation because people are not resigning. They're saying, take this job and shove it. Like they're literally saying, I don't want to do it this way. You can't make me work this way. And so the idea that you are looking at profitability without recognition of what people are going to put up with and what they're not and what they want and what they don't and what makes them productive and what makes them stress to the point where they can't function. Uh, those things are not necessarily separable as I think some CEOs think they are, right? Um, I think when you look at organizations that are sustainable and sustainably profitable, it's because they've taken into account what it means to bring people in. Now, 50 years ago, you could threaten your way into getting people to do what you wanted, right? 50 years ago, you could pay your way into getting people to do what you wanted because people didn't have as many choices. But today, you don't, you can't use fear the same way. You know, you can't say, I'm going to fire you if you don't do what I want you to do because someone's response is going to be, let me save you the trouble I'm leaving right now. You've got, I mean, between the, um, the internet, our connectivity, the ways that we can work and the different types of jobs that are available. If you want top talent, you've got to be listening to what they're saying they can and can't do physically, emotionally, psychologically, um, cognitively. And if you're not paying attention to that, you are right now one of those companies that has a great product, but maybe don't have people. Um, And you're struggling because of that. So the inseparability of people and process and product and um, profit is, I think, what what I think is the biggest lesson, hopefully, that people have taken from coming out of the pandemic over the last two years. These are not separable things, right? And and so as you're going about this research and you're working with these companies, what what are some tangible things that you've that you've realized through this research? that employers can do to, to maintain or to change things that, that were not trivial for them? Sure. I mean, I think one of the most, like just the easiest things is sometimes just things that have been started 20 years ago, 30 years ago, like performance review systems or um, the way feedback is provided. Uh, structurally, culturally, they don't account for generational differences. They don't account for how we work now with technology and how we work with different things. So sometimes it's when we identify what isn't working and we ask people what they want, we can give organizations um, really solid recommendations on you need to, you need feedback needs to include these three things, right? It needs to be this frequent. Um, 
you need to separate, you know, feedback about development from feedback on compensation. Like just just very concrete things that companies can do so that they're that they're taking care of what their people need as opposed to just running systems to be running systems. The other thing that we find a lot of times is a lot of companies focus on best practices, right? There's just they don't work like they don't look into are these best practices actually working? Um, they just see these articles or somebody says this is a best practice. And the next thing you know, there's like eight companies all doing it. And so the ninth company does it too, because like eight companies are doing it. It will go in. And I'm like, wait, stop. What have you actually seen that this has worked anywhere? Right. And that imitative behavior in workplaces is very, very common. So when we get brought in, I'm usually like, I don't really care what you've read. I want to know what's actually working. And when we dig into that, it's usually never what people think it is. So right. that part, it's fun because I, I get to go back to the CEO and say, yeah, no, like that's not what's working at all. So, so how do you explain that? I mean, are you just doing things very innovatively and you're and you're, you're able to understand people differently? Because obviously, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of leaders, a lot of managers out there do want to understand their people. They do want to read the feedback and they want to, to have a grasp of what's going on. How do you explain this, this dissonance between what they think they understand and what they actually understand? Um, I think one is they're trying to understand systems and not people. And you have to marry um, mm. systems with psychology. Like, I mean, you know, humans don't do what they say they're going to do. Right. That's that's human. That's human nature. We I mean, otherwise we wouldn't make New Year's resolutions every year that we would not keep that. It's humans are very good at saying we're going to do a whole bunch of stuff that we're never going to do, although our commitment to doing it is very sincere. Right. So. Right. Organizations try to focus on what people say they're going to do. Um, and <laughs> this is not it's not how psychology works. Uh, the other thing, too, is organizations are hyper-focused on what they believe to be the motivation levers, right? Like compensation and advancement. And when those levers don't work, they don't know what else to do. And so a lot of times, you know, in a lot of organizations, the primary levers that organizations know how to pull are compensation levers and uh, benefits levers and, you know, um, um, and advancement levers. Well, what if the option for somebody is I can do a startup? Well, the compensation lever and the advancement lever isn't going to work, right? So do you really understand what people's levers are? And that's where psychology comes in. And I think people don't always have a really good grasp of that. And I think the last thing is organizations, as you get more senior, you become more risk averse, right? Mm -hmm. And so even with founders, like you, the very thing that made you take the risk, once you start making money, you become more hesitant to make changes. And when you become risk averse, you get stuck. Um, and so one of the things about our firm, for example, I keep it very, very small, right? We don't, I, it's by nature, it's because it's more consistent with my philosophy and my mission. I'm not afraid to say anything to any CEO, any chair of a board. I have sat down with CEOs of Fortune 100 companies and said, you're full of shit. Like this isn't working and you're not listening. <laughs> and so because I'm okay, I don't have to worry about what's going to happen if you fire me, right? Because fine, like we don't do any marketing. We don't do any advertising and we turn away 50% of the work that comes our way. Um, Wow. And so it, it, it must be a pretty good feeling to to have a job where you are as authentic and the more authentic you are, the better, the more exactly. value you're going to provide people. And exactly. the less apologetic you are, the the I mean, it, it, it sounds incredible. At the same time, I can't be hyper focused on making more money, though. Right. Because that reduces the authenticity, because if I try to grow the firm to a point where I'm suddenly worried about taking any at all business, sure. then I don't get that authenticity. And I think that that's the balance that people need to make. 
authenticity and honesty is really important to me. And it'll make me sick to my stomach if I'm not. So my business structure has to reflect that. And um, I don't think other consultants aren't as innovative. There's just a lot of consultants out there who who can sometimes get the same information. They just don't say it to people. They sugarcoat it because they care more about getting the residual work from the company. Um, we actually have a philosophy where if I do an assessment for a company, I do not write us in for any training or anything afterwards. I'm like, um, we're not automatically assuming that at the end of it, put an RFP out for trainers. We will compete with everybody else. And if you pick us, you pick us. And that way, that's also gives us freedom to say whatever we need to say. So my focus is, I want workplaces to be better. I don't want them to give me more business, right? Right. And I think that gives us the freedom to say things. It gives me the freedom to write. Like I write, I mean, my, my, my current book has a whole chapter on cursing. Like, you know, if I was worried about what some conservative CEO was going to think about this woman who was like advocating saying shit in every other sentence because it actually leads to greater authenticity, I can't be worried about that. So I don't want to censor what I write. I don't want to censor what I say. I for sure do not want to censor what I think because of, because of some idea that it's going to lead to more money. Ironically, it's had the opposite effect. Like the more I say I don't give a shit, the more people are like, no, you're exactly who we want in this situation. Right. And I've had, you know, business come my way where people are like, I've heard you're brutally honest. And that is exactly what we there want. There you go. And, and, and like, that's at the end oh. of what kind of people are paying you for, I guess, honesty as a consultant and as a researcher. Exactly. I mean, it sounds still like Because why... CEOs don't have to do what consultants say, right? You, they don't have to listen, but they're not benefited if they're not getting the honest information. 100%. And and uh, and before I, I let you go back to running your consulting firm, what, what why is it that uh, that cursing uh, brings out more authenticity? I mean, obviously, I don't I, I assume that the claim isn't that the actual cursing is what makes you more authentic, but it, but it leads yes. to a behavior that or that it, it reduces some some stress that otherwise exists. What what is it about cursing that does this? So the example that I give in the book, which is really interesting, is it actually shows how um, a chimpanzee started cursing, right? A chimpanzee in sign language started cursing. Cursing is, it's, um, I had the, you know, somebody told me once, cursing is the middle ground between running away and fighting, right? So, and in chimpanzee language, right? It, chimpanzees in the wild, what they do is they will pick up their excrement, they will pick up their shit literally, and they will throw it at you if you piss them off, right? Like the one chimpanzee pisses off another chimpanzee will pick up its shit and throw it at him. And it, to me, it's a great metaphor, but saying shit is me acknowledging I want to throw shit at you, but it's not me actually throwing shit at you, which would be illegal. And so cursing is a way for us to acknowledge that emotion that is happening and to moderate that emotion with also being a social preacher of not giving into some of our impulses, right? And so, like, forget stressing, uh, cursing at people. I don't believe in cursing at people. I curse the, just generally. Yeah. But when you stub your toe on something, for example, right? When you curse, it's actually a way of releasing pain. It hurts less when you curse because your brain feels the intense pain. And if you don't do anything, it's just feeling the pain. Well, of course, yeah. it's a way of actually releasing the pain. When Think about when you are watching a basketball game and when somebody misses a clutch shot and the whole stadium goes, ah, right? Like they're releasing the disappointment. So that kind of not, it, think of cursing as almost like a non-verbal release. We just have words that we use to do it. So I yeah. kind of, you know, I kind of get sarcastic about it, but the neurological impact really is, it is a release of emotion so that you can move on with what you need to do. Otherwise you're stuck feeling that pain, the disappointment, the frustration, et cetera. So it's very similar to grunting, right? Or um, 
screaming or any other kind of um, just expression that we have. So the authenticity is you're feeling the emotion, right? And the minute you say to yourself, it's not okay to feel it, or I'm not supposed to feel it, or I'm not going to express it, your brain now has to do a gazillion gymnastics, processing that it can't do what it wants to do. Um, and the and your ability to tap into what it needs to do sort of disappears a little bit, right? So I don't believe in cursing at people. But I mean, every once in a while, if you just need to say shit, and you're trying to prevent that, like, let that go. Because you need your energy for so many other things. So that's my... I, I, I love the honesty and the <laughs> insights. I mean, it's... Uh, and, I'm, and I'm looking back at myself and I'm, you know, I, I think probably every person that hears this can, you know, is looking back to their own, you know, to their own behavior and to their own times when they do curse or when they don't curse. And and, and I think that everybody can, can, can feel it. And, and obviously not many people share this insight and not many people speak about it in a, in an in an honest and and um, spoken way and so I, I appreciate it and and Aaron I know you're you're very busy with your consulting firm but I I really appreciate your your coming here and being very honest and authentic with me about about how you're diving into companies you're helping uh, CEOs and you're helping helping management just really uncover and and see what they understand and what they don't understand and uh, and really what I'm taking from this is the part about the honesty and authenticity which um which is something that I, I aim to embody myself but but it's i think sometimes we we stop and forget to challenge the premises that we've been given and the assumptions that we that we run our company with that we run our team with and and it sounds like that's exactly Absolutely. what you're doing and you're doing it in a very honest and authentic way so thank you very you much know, and i'll leave people with this that honesty and authenticity is less exhausting um, it's go. way more exhausting to censor yourself all the time. And if you're honest and authentic, maybe not everybody's going to like you, but you're going to have more energy to do what you want to do at the end of the day. Love it. So thank Aaron, you for having me, Michael. Thank you very, very much. This was wonderful. Absolutely.